What comes first, monetization or growth? Passion-driven entrepreneurs often think it's the latter. You have an idea for an innovative product that will change the way we do things. This will be the Uber of something or the Airbnb of something else. You show the product to people and they love it. You attract millions of users, profit. Not to rain on your parade, but how exactly are you planning to make money? If you've clicked this video, you probably know that it's never that easy. Unless you're extremely lucky, earning enough money to sustain your product or even break even is difficult. And not only because of how many marketing and usability challenges you must overcome to attract and retain users, it's also because building a balanced, smart revenue-making model is a skill of its own. So, how to choose a revenue model? And what are your options as a software business? A revenue model describes the different ways your business will generate income. Not a business model, it's one of many building blocks, and it's tightly connected to all the other business elements. Depending on what your product is, what your users expect from such products, your expenses, and competitors, you need to pick a revenue model that will help you sustain and grow your business. In the software industry, there are specific ways your digital product can profit. Often, software revenue models mimic the ones already used in the physical world. For example, many financial apps earn money just like banks. They make a loan to a customer and earn interest. In other instances, the rules are entirely different. No one will buy a $50 app on Google Play Store, but they may pay even more given the chance to use this app for free first. There are two main pathways you can choose for your software product. The first is more traditional, selling access to your product. The second is providing your product free of charge to end users and generating income from other sources. Both paths offer different routes to success. Let's take a closer look at each of them. Most digital businesses use the transaction-based model. It's a simple exchange of money for service. You set a price you think your product deserves, a customer pays it. But there are options. Are you taking the full amount up front and letting people use your product indefinitely? Or will you let them pay a small amount each month? Or maybe you have both options for different user groups. In software distribution, the one-time purchase of a product is called licensing. When someone buys the latest version of Microsoft Windows, they receive a perpetual license to use that one copy of Windows. Because sharing makes you lose sales. Existing from the dawn of software distribution, this model isn't ideal for all. A company needs a constant stream of income, and so they have to continually attract more customers and develop better versions of the software to make their existing clients upgrade. It works for Windows and some other types of products like video games, but for the majority of the software industry, this is not the most viable option. And that said, the industry has already picked its new favorite model subscriptions. When Adobe transitioned to the subscription-based model in 2012, it revolutionized the whole software industry. Customers were happy. They could use the entire Adobe toolset by paying a comparatively small annual or monthly fee and be sure that the software is up to date. For the company, it meant the constant stream of income without having to market new products to their old customers. What's more, you could be flexible with your revenue strategies and experiment with different pricing tiers. For example, Adobe rolled out a separate, cheaper plan for photographers who only needed two products. In 2018, Gartner estimated that all new software products entering the market and 80% of older vendors would have a subscription-based model by 2020. Although it's unclear if we're there yet, the model's popularity hasn't subsided. Subscriptions are favored not only because they benefit most businesses, but also since that's what people are used to. In some cases, it makes more sense to use the pay-per-use method. Let's look at Audible, Amazon's provider of audiobooks. At first glance, they have a classic subscription-based revenue model with two pricing tiers. One gives unlimited access to a small selection of audiobooks, and another tier gives one free audiobook a month from their extended collection. But what if you want to read more than one book a month? Yes, there are different types of readers or listeners. 
Some can barely finish a book in a month, while others will devour a book in a day. Asking both groups to pay the same subscription fee is not fair to customers or the business. So, for people with a larger reading appetite, they have a discount on any additional books above the free one. This means that customers simply pay as much as they use the service. The pay-per-use model allows businesses to acquire customers with different demands and charge them according to memory, computing powers, or resources they're actually using. Customers are happy too, as they never feel bad about paying for unused services. As you can see from the Audible example, the combination of pricing strategies is a great way to create your own perfect revenue-driving mix, and it often involves making your product at least partially free. If you're developing a mobile app, you're probably looking into the freemium revenue-driving approach. The initial app download is free, the same for some basic features. But the more you enjoy the app and incorporate it into your life, the more inclined you are to pay for an extended version that reveals its full potential, or to simply turn off the annoying ads. In some cases though, users can't enjoy the software without the full set of features. For example, in multiplayer video games, where all players should have the same capabilities. The standard game can be free to everyone, but players can pay for fun bonus content like skins or access to exclusive missions. The low entry threshold of the freemium model allows many digital products to earn a huge user base and go viral, but there are other ways to make money with a free product. Depending on the type of business, you can drive money from commissions, ads, or your loyal fans. Let's take a closer look at these methods. Online marketplaces and aggregators that work as an intermediary between end users and other businesses use a commission-based revenue model. Amazon. Etsy, Airbnb, Uber, and many more platforms charge sellers or suppliers when a sale is made on the platform. For example, hotels give up 30% of the booking when people book a room on Expedia. Drivers give money to Uber, restaurants share their profits with DoorDash, and airlines pay for a chance to appear in the kayak search results. Some aggregators charge customers, not suppliers, or both at the same time. This is called service fee. For example, Ticketmaster shares the fee between the seller and the client. Customers go to aggregators because they like the user experience better or when the supplier doesn't have an online presence. Commissions, just like direct payments, can be tiered and applied depending on how many sales the supplier makes. Or they can be based on contractual agreements between a platform and a supplier. The different factors and rules that affect the commission size can be so complex that a platform would use a special commission engine to calculate it every time. The thing is, both suppliers and customers will only access the platform when others are on it too. So, growing a marketplace takes a lot of initial investment and a supporting revenue model. The most accessible one is posting advertisements. If you're not selling your product, you're most likely selling ad space on it. The question is how much your ad space is actually worth. Platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube that turned advertising into the main revenue stream attract massive audiences and know how to connect advertisers with relevant pairs of eyes. Smaller marketplaces, apps, and websites don't have the same luxury. This reason and the customer preference of ad blocks is why relying on ads alone is not a viable revenue model for most businesses. So, why would you use ads anyway? First, if you're a media company, getting users to pay for content they can find elsewhere on the web is almost impossible. But media websites generate a lot of traffic and that can attract advertisers. Second, you can use ads to drive revenue from your non-paying users. That's how the Flappy Bird managed to earn on average $50,000 a day while the whole world was trying to beat the high scores. You may also use ads as a supporting mechanism to your main revenue driving method. For example, in the free tier of the subscription model. But you have to be careful. 
ads, especially when they're abundant or inappropriate, impact how customers perceive your product. So you have a responsibility to filter the ads and make sure they don't distract from your user's experience. If all else fails and ads pose a threat to customer experience, developers turn to donations. When you want to grow a huge user base, having a free product is your best bet, especially when the competition is already priced within a specific range. There are two ways to maintain the business in this way, by opening donations and the pay what you want model. Donations will come willingly from the product's fans. In the pay what you want model, the product has a price, but each customer decides what it is. Have you noticed that we said it's a way to maintain your business, not grow it? That's because the development of such software is mostly driven by the passion of its creators. Small useful tools and fan-created forums and websites, with rare exceptions of tools backed up by large corporations, are supported by their communities who want to keep the product alive and updated. It's also a viable option for the early stages of your startup development when you don't feel confident enough to put a price on the software. To run a successful business that way though, will be almost impossible. Since the revenue can never be predicted or even generated, you'll be lucky to break even. Now, not every business will be able to get any donations at all. As with any other model, there are a few questions you should ask yourself to determine what combination of models and pricing strategies work for your product and your customers. How to choose a revenue model. First question to ask is, how do your customers buy software? Whether you're targeting businesses, gamers, Gen Zs, or fitness enthusiasts, they all have a habit of paying or not paying for specific products. Even groups within those groups matter. Casual and hardcore gamers accept different pricing conditions. If you plan to have different tiers, talk to your target customers first to be perfectly sure what groups they fall into and create adequate pricing ranges for them. Second question is, what is your cost structure? Consider your fixed and variable costs. What's the best combination of revenue streams that can support them? Ad placement and commissions, donations and cheap licensing? If you're using a canvas to sketch your business model out, you can easily connect the dots and see what revenue stream covers what costs and where these costs are coming from. And finally, how do your competitors generate income? When a new streaming service appears on the market, you can be sure it will have a subscription-based model with at least two pricing tiers, for one person and for a family. They also often have a yearly subscription that is cheaper than monthly payments. These cues help industry newcomers understand what's expected from that type of business and learn by example. The balance between free and paid features, the flexibility of pricing plans, the nature of the internet itself have formed the main revenue building strategies that software businesses apply today. Your task is to understand and put them to work for you.